brothers and sisters, grace and peace are yours this day through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It is Father's Day, so in honor of this fine occasion, I thought I would introduce this topic to some of you who may not be familiar with it, at least maybe directly. There is such a thing in this world known as dad jokes. They are not jokes per se, but they are usually punny quips or observations often designed to drive their children to despair. For example, one young man reports this. Whenever we drive past a graveyard, my dad will say, do you know why I can't be buried there? And we all say, why not? And he says, because I'm not dead yet. <laughs> Another exasperatedly whine, if I come downstairs and say, I'm hungry, my dad will always say, hi, hungry, I'm dad. And in the case of a young lady with a dental pain and who grew impatient about her appointment time, she asked her dad, what time do we go to the dentist? And her father replied, 2.30, tooth hurty. Okay, I didn't say these were good, but you can at least respond, all right? Other times dad jokes seemingly come from nowhere for no apparent reason. The family's just sitting around making, minding their own business and maybe playing on their phones and dad will say, Two guys walk into a bar. The third one ducks. Oh, that's so good. All right. A turkey sandwich walks into a bar and orders a beer. The bartender says, sorry, we don't serve food here. Guys, nice. slow. Come on. Ah, finally. In honor of Father's Day, a three-legged dog walks into the bar and says to the bartender, I'm looking for the man who shot my paw. All right. One last one. Did you know that our gospel reading today has the first biblically recorded mention of luncheon meat? Yes, Jesus made deviled ham. <sighs> okay, none of these are actually very good and that is exactly the point. But I like to start things out with some humor on occasion because, well, often it is one of my defense mechanisms to lighten up or to deflect some tension or anxiety either in congregation or in my own family. And I think a lot of dads operate in the same way. I know my father did, and I know my grandfathers have as well. And as I look around the world today, I see the tragedy that took place in Orlando, and I see that people are yelling at each other and yelling past each other and blaming this or that or insulting each other horribly. And honestly, I am struggling with all of this. There is a cultural tension that dad jokes alone cannot fix, and I need on this day some good news, some news that will bring me hope. And I think we find it in our scripture today. Today we hear that Jesus had crossed the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee is not just your normal lake. There's a reason why they call it the sea. It's much larger than Redstone. It's not like taking a pontoon ride from one end to the other of, of Redstone. It literally stretches from the parking lot here at church to the parking lot of the Senex station in Wanawak, all right? That's about the distance in one direction. And the other direction is from the farthest edge of Lake Redstone all the way down to Casnovia. That's the territory the, the Sea of Galilee takes place. And on that body of water, when the wind kicks up, it can really cause quite enormous storms that are, well, quite frightening. And in fact, that's exactly what had happened to Jesus and the disciples on the way over before our reading today. They were in the storm and they were scared to death. Jesus stills that storm. And the disciples are asking this question. They're like, whoa, who is this one that even the wind and the waves obey him? That question was likely still running through their minds when they came ashore and immediately ran into someone, or rather some things, that will help answer that question for them and for us. What is interesting to note is that this man was not asking for help. He was not requesting a healing. In fact, he would have rather that Jesus just left him alone. It's a horrible scene that Jesus stumbles upon on many levels. On this side of the lake, it is Gentile territory, which was unclean. 
He is visiting a demon-possessed man who is unclean, who lives amongst the tombs which are unclean, and eventually casts out a demon into the pigs which are unclean with an exclamation mark. The whole scene would have given any good Jew in Jesus' day, as well as us, the heebie-jeebies. And while this man was still alive physically, he was in almost every other way dead as you can be. We know this feeling though, don't we? I know I do. You've been battered and beat down. You've been crushed or abandoned. And whether we've done this to ourselves by our own actions or whether we've had others do it to us, we sit and we wallow in our self-pity and we die to ourselves. We just want to be left alone and we have in some ways grown comfortable with our surroundings, as miserable as they may be. I've dealt with many people, and myself too, as I've mentioned, who have demons that just want to be left alone because we are too afraid to do anything about it. We are too afraid of the situation. But the gospel and the good news is that Jesus does not let that stop him. He comes and breaks into our worlds and offers us peace and wholeness. There's a great story that John Killinger, a pastor and author, tells about a businessman who was up in, in Canada for business meetings, and he was staying at a very posh hotel up there. But he was in a deep, deep state of depression. He is so depressed that he can't even bring himself to go downstairs to the restaurant to eat. He is a very powerful man, the chairman of a large shipping company, but at this moment he is absolutely overwhelmed by the pressures and demands of life. He lies there on a lonely hotel bed, far from home, wallowing in his self-pity. He worries and he broods and he ruminates about everything. His business, his investments, his decisions, his family, his health, even his dogs. Then on this day in this Canadian hotel room, he craters completely. He hits bottom. He is filled with anxiety, completely immobilized, paralyzed by his emotional despair, unable to leave his room, lying on his bed. He moans out loud, life is not worth living this way. I wish I were dead. And then he wonders, what would God think if he heard him talking this way? Speaking aloud again, he says, God, it's a joke, isn't it? This life, nothing but a joke. And suddenly, it occurs to him that this is the first time he's talked to God since he was confirmed. He's silent for a while, and then he begins to pray. And he describes it like this. I just talked out loud about what a mess my life was, and how I was tired, and how much I wanted things to be different in my life. And you know what happened next? I heard a voice. And that voice said, it doesn't have to be that way. That's all. He went home and talked to his wife about this whole experience. And then he talked to his brother, which was a bit of a trial because his brother was actually a minister and confessing to him that he hadn't prayed since he was a compromise was a bit of a stretch. But he asked his brother this question, do you think God was actually speaking to me? And his brother said, of course I do. Because that is the message of God to you and to every one of us. That is the message of the Bible. That is why Jesus Christ came into the world to save us, to deliver us, to free us, to change us, and to show us that it doesn't have to be that way. A few days later, the man called his brother and said, you're right, it has really happened. I've done it, I've had a rebirth, I'm a new man. Christ has turned it around for me. Now, this man is still prone to anxiety, he still works a little too hard, a little too long, but now he has a source of strength. During the week, he will often take time off from his office to go to a small church nearby, and there he will sit and pray. He says, it clears my head, and it reminds me of who I am and whose I am. Each time as I sit there in the sanctuary, I think back to that day in the hotel room in Canada, and about how depressed and lonely and lost I felt, and I hear that voice saying, it doesn't have to be that way. What starts out sounding like the beginning of a Stephen King novel in our gospel today ends because it doesn't have to be that way. And in Christ, this situation is completely turned around. 
We come on the scene where the man is naked and not in his right mind. And after Jesus did his thing with the devil, Ham, people went to run and tell others. And as they come back, as our gospel says, people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man whom the demons had, uh, from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. I've always wondered where they got the clothes from sitting out there in the middle of no place. But we're not told. But I think we can say in the light of our first reading today that he has literally been clothed in Christ. Where there once had been an incoherent, slobbering mess of humanity, pulled and tugged in every direction by a legion of demons, there was now just a man, clothed and in his right mind, who had in Christ received a new start. He had been dead in nearly every way, but was now born again, resurrected in Christ. When Paul talks about putting on Christ, we are not diminished, but rather we are free to be fully who we are created to be. When he was possessed by his demons, this man was not who he was. He was not in his right mind. But putting on Christ, he becomes more fully who God made him to be in the first place. You would think that this story would have a happy ending, and it sort of does, but it's not the one you expect. What happens when the people encounter this once demon-possessed man and his Savior is fascinating to me. But I confess I have felt this way from time to time myself. Seeing the man healed and fully in his right mind, what was their response? They were afraid. The fact is, This freaked them out so much that all the people of the surrounding countryside asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. Sometimes we just want the bad guys to stay the bad guys. We want to be able to blame somebody for something. And after the events of this past week, people are blaming anything they can to justify the demonic. And this is not right. People are blaming and blaming and blaming guns and gays and Islam and God, you name it. They blame everything except for themselves. We play the blame game because we do not want to wrestle with difficult situations or make choices that would, heaven forbid, change us in the light of Christ. When the crowd saw what had happened, they had their expectations challenged and they were scared silly. Jesus knew nothing. he could do nothing with that people, filled with fear. So he got back into the boat and returned, as our gospel tells us. But this is not yet the end of the story. Because while it was logical that the man would want to follow Jesus, Jesus had a different job for him. There would come a time when the fear would die down a little bit. When some people, anyway, would listen to him and to his story. No longer was he living a life of death. His story had a happy ending. His story ended in life, not death. It was a story of change, of resurrection, and of unmerited grace. Remember the disciples' question again? Who is this that even the storm, the wind, and the waves obey him? Listen now to what happened at the end of the story. Jesus sent him away saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And what did the man do? Well, he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. We find that this Jesus is in fact God. Here he is to calm our fears, to cast out the demons and garbage from our lives, and to clothe us, to cover us, to transform us with his life given for us. This is grace. This gives us peace in a troubled world when all others fear it, and it allows us to reach out in love. Paul reminds us that in Christ there is no playing the blame game. There is no us and them. We are all God's children in faith and heirs to the promise. We are loved by God the Father now and for eternity because of what Christ has done for us. And that, my friends, is good news. That, my friends, offers us hope. And that, my friends, is no joy.
Amen. Pray with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, you come to us in your Son so that we might clothe ourselves in your grace, mercy, and love. Be with us as we confront the demons in our lives, cast out fear and hate, and enable us to live fully in your life as your beloved children. Amen. Amen.